get started. Uh, we've got a very tight schedule here. Um, this talk is supposed to end at 12.45, and uh, I and uh, my colleague here, we're going to both co-present. Anyways, before that, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Tushar Pitarki, and with me I have Neil Levine. Uh, we are both going to talk about uh, enterprise storage for uh, OpenStack. Uh, I am a product manager at Red Hat in the storage business, and Neil comes to us from Think Tank, uh, the big acquisition that uh, uh, was talked about at length even in the previous panel. Um, just, just concluded on the other side, so I'm sure we'll. Uh, so what we decided we'd do is, since this all happened really rather quickly in the past two weeks, uh, what I and Neil said was that you know I'll go through a quick introduction of. Uh, kind of open stack uh, in general and all the storage technologies from a Red Hat point of view. And then we will focus on the Ceph part because I know Ceph is very popular within the uh, open stack community. And so we'll let him talk about Ceph a bit later. So we're going to kind of uh, uh, give you this up in that way. So we'll talk about 15 minutes. We'll talk about 15 minutes and hopefully we'll have a few minutes left at the end for questions. So without further ado, uh, real quick a bit about me. I've been at Red Hat for three years. Uh, this is my second uh, summit, uh, OpenStack summit, and it's uh, always great to be here and see all, all other people. I'm sure uh, you feel the same with that. And Neil will uh, give a little bit about himself when he comes by. So uh, here's what I want to talk about. A uh, quick introduction to both OpenStack as well as Red Hat stake on OpenStack. And then we'll dive into you know, what are the storage use cases in OpenStack? Surely uh, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of, uh, of you might be aware of Cinder and the volume service, but then there are a few other services, storage uh, things that you've got to consider in OpenStack. So we'll talk about that, specifically Cinder, as I said, Manila, which is the newest uh, kind of project uh, for file sharing. And then uh, finally, OpenStack object, uh, Swift, which is probably the oldest, one of the oldest projects in OpenStack, and then we'll have a summary and then shoot over to Neil. With that, um, let me go over to this, which is OpenStack. Uh, so uh, OpenStack really is a infrastructure uh, for cloud-enabled uh, workloads. It's an it's a infrastructure platform for cloud-enabled workloads. And the way it is really built is it's, uh, it's very uh, the basic tenets really are a modular architecture. So because of that, you will see all these different services uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and then uh, it's uh, the modular architecture gives flexibility not only uh, from a user and admin perspective, but also from a developer perspective. Uh, the developers uh, are, 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 can, can uh, hide some implementation details and make progress independently, whereas from a uh, from an admin perspective, they can expect these various services to talk to each other. So there is a lot of value to this modular architecture. It's designed for easy scale out. So I think uh, the idea again with cloud really is that you want it to be elastic, and for you to be elastic, you want uh, your, uh, uh, your services to scale out seamlessly, start small, scale out, scale up, scale down, uh, that sort of stuff. And then finally, uh, you know, it's based on a core set of services you'll see here, and it is ever growing. I mean, that's one of the exciting things about OpenStack is that the basic set of core services, and then all these projects which uh, are, uh, help you add value on top of it. So, so at a very high level, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, Horizon is the dashboard uh, which uh, allows you for uh, a self-service, and then you have all these. Uh, uh, Core services below that, starting with NOAA, which is your compute service. That's where you get your uh, uh, virtual instances. You can request, and uh, NOAA will give you that. And then you have three storage uh, services. One for one, one for Glance, which is the image service. That's where you can store your ISO, where you can store your, uh, you know, OSs, if you will, to put your guests into. Then you have the uh, volume service here at the end, which is Cinder. <coughs> Uh, which allows you to uh, basically think about them as virtual block devices, and then you have object store with, with Swift, and then to you know pair them all together, you have networking. In, uh, it was formerly called Quantum, now it's called Neutron, uh, and then finally on the right you have the identity service, which is Keystone. Okay, uh, so this is at a very high level, a quick 30-second tutorial on OpenStack, so that we are all grounded. 
So what's, again, another quick introduction to what is Red Hat's offering with OpenStack. We call it Red Hat Enterprise uh, OpenStack Platform. So one of the things that we realize is OpenStack is great, it's innovating, it's going fast, but at the same time, enterprises are always looking for uh, you know, stability. They want to deploy it in production environments. And so what we did was we put OpenStack and ship it on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And so uh, with that, what you get is the uh, you know, OpenStack integrated with the world's most trusted and proven uh, Linux operating system. Uh, and so you get the hardening, you get the stability and the life cycle associated with that, which enterprise customers uh, uh, care about. And then the other advantage is uh, Red Hat Enterprise already has an extensive partner ecosystem, so you are able to leverage that with OpenStack and extend that. So that's kind of the bringing the uh, good of both worlds, OpenStack innovation, Red Hat Enterprise Linux stability, and so that's basically what you're getting with the Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform. So this talk is going to, I, I mentioned this because this talk is about going to be about what are the storage choices in such an environment. So this is kind of Red Hat point of view, if you will, you know, uh, but I, it will, oh, I also have a generic uh, uh, description also. So, so what are the OpenStack storage use cases? We talked about Cinder, which is by far the best known, I would say, which is your volume service, right? Once you create a guest, once you create a virtual instance, you really need some virtual block devices uh, so that you can create file systems on them or do whatever you want. Uh, you know, and so that's your volume service you can do with Cinder. It's a multi-tenant block storage service. We'll delve into that. The other one, which is kind of not that much, doesn't receive much attention is local storage, you know. So that is the storage that, think about the disks, uh, that, that's like the ephemeral storage. Uh, the, the think about them as disks attached to the hypervisor. Uh, and so uh, the local storage tends to be LVM, but what happens really are local disks. But if you are looking for live migration, if you are looking, uh, and if your uh, hypervisor requires a shared storage, like KVM requires shared storage, for live migration, then you would need some uh, shared storage beneath that. So bear this in mind. Uh, the next one really is Glance, which is the image repository. Uh, this is, like I said, this is where you put your ISOs and you could expect uh, your, uh, you know, uh, your volumes, uh, sorry, your uh, no instances to boot from there. So that's where you store your ISOs. Uh, and then you finally have the object store. We'll talk a little bit about that a little later, but object store can be used for things such as backup. Uh, and uh, a couple of other things uh, that we'll touch upon. Uh, so th those are the kind of the, like I said, the current use cases. These are uh, projects which are already um, uh, within OpenStack. Now there are a couple of emerging use cases. One which is known as Manila, which is file sharing, and we are extremely excited about that because uh, we Red Hat and, and uh, we are contributing with people like NetApp right here uh, to, to cre basically create what we call a multi-tenant uh, network attached storage. So, if, uh, and uh, that's uh, Project Manila. I will talk about that in detail also. And then finally, you have something called Hadoop in OpenStack. I think about it as kind of elastic uh, Hadoop, if you will. Uh, you know, that's how I look at it. Uh, and uh, there, you, you need storage too, and you need object shared, object and file services, and that's Project Sahara, which also Red Hat is uh, contributing to. So, with that, I'm not going to spend too much time on um, the Hadoop as well as the local ephemeral. We don't have time. So I'll focus on Cinder. I'll focus on Manila, which is the file service, and the uh, Swift, which is the object service. So with that, we'll go to Cinder, which is the volume service uh, for blocks. So uh, with, uh, this is kind of a high-level uh, representation of what Cinder is all about. From a user perspective, what do you want, right? So a couple of workflows uh, you, you see in top. Uh, the first one is really you want to request a NOAA instance, right? I want a guest, I want a virtual instance. Then I want to request a volume or a block, uh, or a virtual block device. Uh, and then what I want to do is that I want to attach that to that uh, virtual instance so that then like, a, like I can do whatever I want. I can do uh, uh, with it, right, uh, from a user perspective. So that's one. The second workflow also is slight, uh, slightly different from that, which is, you know, I want to request a bootable volume uh, as opposed to just a regular volume. I want to request a bootable volume and then say that boot directly from that 
uh, uh, who, who the NOAA instance directly from that volume. So these are kind of the two high level use cases here. And in, in both the cases, what happens is it, it, uh, you, you, you could do it through the Horizon uh, self-service portal, or you could, uh, they're all RESTful APIs, the NOAA API, the Simple API, you could request it through there. But anyways, if you request a NOAA instance, it goes to NOAA, and you know, there's scheduling and all that hap good stuff happens, but ultimately what you get is a guest. Let's say you get, get guest zero here. The next what you're doing is you request a volume, so it goes to the Cinder API, and then Cinder basically there's a queue and then it gets scheduled uh, by a scheduler, and the scheduler is policy driven, and you can have different kinds of policies uh, based on uh, filters and weights, and, and talk about that, and, and basically it's going to decide, okay, so I, uh, Cinder has this concept of storage backends, you could have different storage backends, I show here SAP, it could be cluster, it could be LVM, it could be, uh, there are other uh, storage backends, right, other storage backends. So it so basically that uh, request for volume based on your filters and weights uh, is basically scheduled on one of these uh, uh, storage backends and and, and and the volume is uh, created. The next thing you want to do then is that then you then you attach that volume to a guest and so that then it shows up as like for instance slash dev slash VPA inside that guest, right? Now, that's a virtual device. That's one uh, use case. The other use case, like I said, is uh, what you would do is you would request a bootable volume. Again, it gets created, and then you just say boot from that. You know? and, and, and so those are the two uh, use cases in Syndra at a very high level. Uh, the next one really is, oh, the, 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 now I'm going to talk, start talking about the different backends. Uh, the Syndra with Ceph is obviously one of the most popular ones. Uh, in, in open stack today, and Neil is going to go into that. Uh, I'll leave it to him. Uh, and, and then I'll talk a little bit about Synod with Gluster. Uh, Gluster is a file system, is a, uh, obviously a distributed file system, but what we have done really with contributions from others, and I talk about, uh, is uh, what is known as virtual block over files. So this is kind of a high level. For those of you who don't know Gluster, let's start there, right? So it's based on, you, you start with your disk, you create your LVM, uh, uh, and then you create a file system such as XFS on top of it, and that forms a brick. You can take multiple bricks like this and stitch them together with a global norms namespace, and that becomes a glass volume. And so what you have done now is that you have exported that glass volume, and on this side, there, there is NOAA, you can go through LibWord uh, and QKVM, and either you can access that glass volume via Fuse, which is uh, filing uh, in land, uh, file system in user land or, uh, and the cluster client, or you can go through uh, a contribution that IBM did uh, 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 maybe a year ago, which, which is known as the block device translator, which provides this translation layer from QMUKVM into uh, a libjf API, which is one of our POSIX-like uh, library interface for cluster. So either way, you get back onto cluster and uh, you, know, you can access a basically a block device uh, on, a, on a file system. So, so that's how we do it with uh, Luster. So, so those are the two things. The, the final thing I want to talk about Cinder really is uh, tiering. Uh, one of the advantages, uh, one of the things that I mentioned in Cinder really was it can have different uh, backends. So the two advantages with that really is a, it allows for scaling, so not only can the underlying storage system scale out, Glasgow can scale out, Ceph can scale out, but also you can think about Cinder also scaling out by having different uh, storage backends. Uh, the other thing that it does, it allows you to do tiering, and I want to touch upon this uh, real quick, because as you think about, uh, I mean, you know, you probably are familiar with Amazon, you go and you, you can get uh, you know, provision IOPS there, or you can get, you know, regular, uh, you know, uh, EBS volumes, either uh, provision IOPS or, or not. So it's, you got to start thinking as you start implementing uh, Cinder or storage, you got to think about uh, tiering. Uh, the, uh, the one way to look at it really is you, you, you can have, there is one way to actually tier your storage uh, uh, solution. This is the SLA that you could offer to your internal customers if you're doing a private cloud with OpenStack. Uh, for instance, you could have a performance optimized tier, you could have a throughput optimized tier, and a capacity optimized tier, and the performance one could be based on all SSDs, and it has a certain amount of IOPS guarantees, whereas the capacity optimized tier on this right-hand side is probably more cost uh, and capacity optimized. So, so you could do that with Cinder uh, by just basically defining your storage tiers, then you choose your filters and weights, 
Uh, and this is uh, currently there are a couple of a couple of filters and grades available in Cinder, uh, mostly capacity based. In you know either you can say that oh you know uh, you know uh, spread it around or load it up you know kind of capacity based filters. But you know obviously for the developers among you that's a region where uh, of OpenStack Cinder which can uh, can can use some uh, more uh, innovation. Uh, certainly, uh, in maybe you have an IAPS-based uh, filter, for instance, and ways. Uh, and then you can uh, create a corresponding volume tag and say, oh, I, uh, you know, uh, it's a Cinder API, and then you just say, I create a volume of this volume tag. For instance, you could have volume tag gold, silver, platinum, bronze, right? And then uh, silver, and, and then uh, the volume can then be uh, placed on that tier so that it gets that kind of SLA. So, uh, so, and then the Cinder scheduler does the rest. You know, it'll, when you create that volume of the desired volume type, it's going to filter all the other storage backends away and only pick the ones uh, that match that profile and it's going to then based on a weighing uh, scheme or a policy, it'll basically schedule that. I think I might be uh, to speed this up. So next I'll quickly talk about file. Uh, and the file really here is uh, at, at a very high level, it's a, as I said, multi-tenant secure file share as a service. Uh, think about it as a symbol for shared file systems. Uh, and uh, you know, in fact, it started. It's uh, uh, it started uh, within Cinder, and then it came out of Cinder, and, and now it's an independent project. Uh, and right now, the NFS and SIS protocols are, uh, are supported. Uh, actually, let me go back and quickly illustrate what this file sharing means. Right. So think about all these guests: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they want to uh, and uh, think about a marketing share, or they want an R and D share, and a finance. Share and they want to be shared by these different guests here, and so uh, this is a service which enables that. So that's uh, Project Manila um, via uh, currently by NFS and SIPS. Uh, so as I said, uh, I mean this. Why do we? Why are we doing it? Uh, it's because customers are asking for it. There's a lot of uh, file uh, still out there, um, uh, file uh, applications requiring file access, uh, and a lot of uh, storage is still based on files. Uh, and uh, so, so basically, we needed something, uh, and, and doing anything which is, and just in true OpenStack way, we wanted to do it in a platform agnostic way, right? And so, uh, so who are the contributors? NetApp is leading the effort. Red Hat is a contributor. Mirante, CMC, IBM, uh, you know, and you can find it today at, uh, on those places. And and we and on Wednesday we have a talk uh, which goes into the details of the implementation of Mirante. So at uh, ten o'clock. So for those of you who might want to. Consider that. So, what are we doing for Gluster for Manila? Right now, uh, what we have is a we have a distributed. Uh, uh, I explained what Gluster is. So, I'm not, uh, so what we are doing really is that we have a single tenant Gluster FS driver today, uh, which uh, uses NFS v3 uh, or Gluster NFS, which is a user land NFS v3 implementation. Uh, and then in the future, what we want to do really is we want to expand this to be a more of a multi-tenant uh, driver. So uh, I think this is what I call the or crawl walk, if you will. Uh, so we have the crawl phase just to illustrate that uh, real quick. Again, we wanted these different shares, uh, sales, marketing, and uh, uh, I use engineering here. Uh, and you create that uh, volume. Uh, uh, you create the, uh, you create those shares under uh, cluster Manila volume, as you can see, the blue is cluster. And then what you can do is you can use Manila create uh, and the cluster FS driver, and basically uh, the, that creates the share, right? So some slash marketing, for instance, and uh, behind cluster. And then when you say Manila access allow, it basically allows access to a particular uh, guest, for instance, 10.1.1 to marketing, and so it, it maintains that ACL, if you will, that marketing can be accessed by 10.1.1, for instance. And so it only allow access to those, uh, to that guest. So that's the file sharing business. And you could have, obviously, attached it to multiple guests so that you can actually share the files. Oh, uh, the next one really is object storage. Um, uh, so Swift, for those of you who don't know it, like five seconds, it's a RESTful API, highly available, distributed. Uh, eventually consistent order. Uh, I think the bottom line really, and I put, uh, I've taken it from, uh, I think the wiki, the Swift wiki, which is store data efficiently, safely, and cheaply. I think that's kind of the bottom line with Swift. Uh, for object, uh, certainly object is a very emerging uh, use case. Uh, and so, um, uh, and 
So what are the use cases within Swift uh, for, uh, for, for Swift in OpenStack? Uh, the main ones really are uh, backup target. So if you have Cinder, uh, you want to back up your volumes, you can use Swift. Uh, of course, there are other, uh, there is some, uh, Ceph also provides that, so you could use either Ceph or, uh, or you could use uh, Swift. Uh, you could uh, uh, use a glance image store, uh, you can use it for as a glass, glance image store uh, instead of it being a LVM or a file system such as uh, Gluster. Uh, or you can use it for um, uh, Hadoop, uh, which is an emerging use case with Project Sahara. Uh, or it can be, uh, you know, as in, in OpenStack, you want to just, uh, you know, build up an object store theory grounds up so that you want to store objects on it. So it, it's a number of the least following use cases. And so, so what are the OpenStack uh, Swift storage options that are available today? So Swift started off with XFS and LVM as the storage backend that it could offer. But when Gluster uh, looked at uh, Swift, what we did really was we offered something known as Gluster Swift. Uh, which basically uh, allows you to have something like Gluster as a storage backend for Swift. So there's Swift on top, and you can have either LVM or you can have uh, a Gluster. And we called it actually, we moved it and called it Swift on file because what we found is that, you know, that contribution also can lead to any generic concepts like files to be able to use that thing, right? So, so we instead of calling it Gluster Swift, we are calling it Swift on file now. And then finally, the other work that we did was something known as disk file again enables multiple storage packages and uh, you know potentially uh, even Ceph at some point it could potentially use something like this uh, to do that. So. Uh, so the other exciting thing that is happening in Swift really that, uh, with, uh, which is, this is in flight right now is what is known as storage policies. Uh, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to do a policy based uh, uh, storage, data storage for object. And so you could either, uh, with storage policies, you could either choose a performance. So maybe you could have, again, like the way we talked about with Cinder, you could have SSD tier and you could have like, a tier based on SATA disk, and the SSD tier is going to be a performance tool, and the uh, SATA disk tier is going to be a capacity optimized tool. So you could do that with storage policies, or you could choose different uh, uh, SLAs, such as resiliency, durability, and availability. You could have uh, you know, three-way or four, a three-way replication on one side because you want a lot of uh, uh, availability with erasure coding if you want durability, or on the other side you may not, right? So, so it allows you to do these tiers. So with that, I'm going to summarize. I know I kind of went very fast because I want to give a good time. But the point really, we talked about Red Hat's enterprise offering for OpenStack. Uh, and then we talked about the different storage choices. Volume with Cinder Ceph is definitely very popular here. Although you do, I illustrated how we do with Cluster. Uh, you know, and, and we talked about tiering and uh, how to start thinking about tiering. Uh, and then we talked about uh, you know file sharing with Manila uh, and Gluster as a backend for that. And then finally we talked about object with Swift, uh, currently XFS and LVM, and you know it was soon with the help of this file and Swift on file you could have multiple storage backends. So with that I'll hand it over to Nino. Thank you. We have questions a little later. Seth. Which we have, which um, will at some point become a full Red Hat product. 
Um, and I'll try to give some time for questions, and I'm sure a lot of people have questions about what the future is, and uh, you may not have any answers, but I'll give you the best ones I can. Um, okay, so Seth is the technology for the upstream project as uh, Red Hat um, W40 things. It's about 10 years old now, that's 10 years old in June. And it's uh, very simple to cluster. It's also an open source, massively scalable, distributed storage system. Very different architecturally. Um, and it has, um, obviously, a slightly different set of features. Um, the core point here is we do object, block, and bar, all in a single technology. Not necessarily a single platform. You don't have to all run this in a single cluster, although you can. Um, but it's a single common technology for running all of these different types of storage. So the object service is, you know, for those of you who know Amazon S3, so if you want to build your own S3 type systems, you can go and do that, build up some public or private. And it's very heavily integrated into the OpenStack ecosystem through looks into Keystone and so on and so forth. Um, importantly here it is it re-implements the Swift API within its uh, separate piece of code. So it's not just a plugin, as uh, Tushar was indicating, it's it works slightly differently. Uh, currently though there are some experiments to get um, RADOS, which obviously is our backend system working with the Swift proxy. Um, the block storage, which is the thing that most people in the OpenStack community know us for, um, is a uh, very, uh, uh, very well integrated with um, the OpenStack community through obviously the Cinder driver system here. And it supports what are called loosely called enterprise features, so it does snapshots, cloning, it does copy and write, and other such features. And I'll go into the use cases around that um, in a second here. And then finally, the oldest part, but actually the, the, um, the one piece which we didn't productize yet is the file system, which is the most compiled file system, just like cluster. Again, slightly different architecture, it uses distributed metadata, um, but similarly it has some of its HDFS and other bits and pieces. So a lot of features, it's a small snapshot. Um, architecturally though, um, Seth is an object store at its lowest level. It has an object store called Rados, which is a very, very scalable um, um, distributed object store. And on top of that object store, we then expose out the different um, hooks or the different um, services you can get. So the object gateway, which provides the S3 and the Swift API called IGW, sits on top of it. The block device called RBD, which is the long used in the OpenStack, again, sits on top of the Rados object store. And so does the file system for both its data and its metadata. So sometimes analysts get us confused and say, well, Seth is an object store, but then people go, I'm using this block. Architecturally, we are an object store, but you can consume storage in many different ways. And over 10 years, a lot of the development has really been focused on the radius layer. That's the bit where the data is stored. That's the bit you want to be fast, reliable, resilient. It's a completely decentralized, no single point of failure system um, that's designed to run on commodity hardware. And so the two major components of the radar system for the technical mind of view are the monitors and the OSDs. The monitors are just there to sit and look at what's going on in the cluster. They see what's up, what's down, who's serving data and who isn't. Um, so they're just they're not in a data path at all, they're just there to keep an overview of the state of the cluster, the cluster map. The actual data sits on what we call OSDs, which is just a process which is commonly associated with the disk or RAID set if you want to. And you can have as many of those OSDs in a single chassis as you want, so we can just have one OSD in the chassis. Um, and those are things which you just scale out infinitely. Keep adding them, adding servers with disks, with processes. And the system works probably more, got more in common with uh, BitTorrent than it does with, say, NetApp. All of these OSD processes and all of the monitor software processes, they just talk to each other through a gossip protocol um, to just make sure that they know who's up, who's, who's got what data. Automatically rebalance if nodes go out. Um, they'll start moving data around to, to meet up the distribution. So a very, very decentralized peer-to-peer -peer based storage system. So again, all of the sort of the the hard work over the past 10 years have been making that incredibly robust. Um, and once you get that architecture right, laying one of the features on top um, becomes more simpler. So this came out from the last um, user survey, um, I think at uh, the Hong Kong Summit, showing that Seth after LVM, which is basically used using open storage, is, is one of the most popular storage technologies um, in the community. Um, so what's great for, for us, or I think Red Hat, is this is Greenfield the product for the most part. You know, SAP is really being installed for the first time, whereas a lot of the other technologies, they're already in, in, the, um, in the business, or already in the data center, people are just repurposing them. But here we can see that SAP has really been delivered 
um, uh, through OpenStack for the improvement of the products. We're very interested to see what the next, the next uh, user survey stats uh, show. Okay, uh, the product. So um, we created a product based on the technology, just like Red Hat do, with their upstream uh, technologies going into downstream products. And we call this product Think Tank 7 Enterprise. It will continue to be called Think Tank 7 Enterprise for the time being. I'll explain we have a new version coming out very, very shortly. Um, and kind of very similar to well, it's a subscription based product, um, charging capacity currently, and it's just a single price for your protocol, so no nickel and mining. <coughs> and it consists of the open source technology at its base. Just for the object and block side, we don't include the uh, file technology at the moment, we don't consider it GA yet. We, now, we also have a um, management platform called Calamari, which uh, was proprietary, is now going to become open source. We're very excited about that, hopefully, getting a community around that. Um, uh, we are going to have some enterprise plugins coming out soon, hopefully that's still going to be the case, which will allow you to put Windows um, VMware ecosystems to use the same storage backend um, uh, running on RHEL, and then obviously the support services and so on. So the important thing to note about the product is it contains less than the upstream technology, not more. There's a hardened set of bits, which should, and all the dependencies, just all the things you need to run, have been tested. So there's a lot of stuff in the staff community which we do not bring into the product because it's not the right level of maturity. So again, very similar to Red Hat um, in terms of how their product process works. So it's probably very familiar with the Red Hat So, how does it work in OpenStack? Um, very heavily integrated with Rover. Um, on the object side, as I mentioned, uh, we support the Swift API um, and we're integrated into the Keystone. So if you want a big replacement for the default Swift implementation, um, we're looking for a slightly better performance, or obviously the ability to run a block and single uh, setup, which is very advantageous if you're doing a POC, then um, that's, that's, this is a common uh, use case. But it's the block side which um, most people um, sort of know us for. Or, and again, we, we, we hook into Cinder, so just you know, give me a volume, delete that volume, um, snapshot that volume, that's all done through the Cinder API. Um, but importantly here, we, we hook into both Cinder and Glove simultaneously. So why is this important? Well, we do copy on the right cloning, which means if you want to start up 100 or 1,000 VMs, you press a button and it just happens almost instantaneously. You're not actually provisioning 100 or 1,000 real images. Um, you can take your base image in Glance and just say, I want to use that. And all of the VMs will start using it for copyright. So as soon as the changes start to happen, that's when the right happens. It's really just a virtual sort of memory construct up until that point. So you get very, very, very fast boot times with lots of VMs. So that cloning, that, cl that cloning capability with copyright, very fast boot times. And then again, we do snapshots at the volume level. So you just want to snap back that block device, um, uh, typically for a data volume. Um, and then put that back into to, uh, plants, or if you want to actually move it over to the, to the object store, you can do that too. And nice, uh, a nice feature now is that we, you know, we support both the ephemeral volumes and we support the data volumes. So you can actually get to the point where you run a completely uh, diskless, uh, lower compute nodes on the front end, and just have all of your stories managed by set on the back end. So it's kept there for both the boot um, volumes, uh, and the data volumes as well as the library stuff going up. So a single um, storage platform for pretty much everything you need to the block. Um, and then, kind of similar to how the, uh, uh, the KPM cluster uh, interaction works, the actual way that the compute hypervisor uh, talks to the storage backend, again, we've, we've coded one of our libraries directly into KVM, so it knows how to mount and unmount and so on and so forth. Um, so that currently works with KVM. Uh, it does work with Zen, not Zen survey yet, it does have a preview. Um, but you know, for KVM users, it's all pretty much serious. So the good news is, before the acquisition, we were already a Red Hat partner, conveniently. So the solution between the Ink Tank Step Enterprise product and RHEL OS Q4 is all certified. So it's all been blessed and it's all kosher. And when RHEL OS Q5 comes out um, uh, in a month or two, uh, again, the will work uh, seamlessly, works between uh, the hypervisor and Cinder, all works seamlessly, all running on RHEL, and um, we think Tech Enterprise will be supported on RHEL 7 when it goes GA, um, hopefully next month. 
uh, very quickly a couple of the other use cases and then I'll, I'll open up for questions is, um, in addition to OpenStack, if you're just doing a generic storage as a service or cloud storage uh, um, uh, offering, then very common deployments, uh, where you're just essentially using the script or the S3 protocol that's on the object store. Um, but for those of you who are really running high performance kind of web scale applications, then you can actually remove out the S3 uh, Swift RESTful API and use our own native protocol, which is extremely fast. You remove a level of abstraction, which is kind of convenient for developers and end users. But if you're really trying to hard code this into your application, um, you support the native protocol, which will give you uh, true client cluster, not client server, but one to many interactions between your application code and the storage on the back end. And we have a couple of very, very large customers and guardians at the moment, which I'll quickly be announced soon. Okay, very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Um, we have a new product coming out called uh, Intex Enterprise 1.2, hopefully out in this month, or maybe next month. Um, we've got some big features here. We have erasure coding and cache tiering as the two headline features. I'll explain a little bit about those. Um, cache tier, uh, for those of you who run Ceph within OpenStack, to speed up your block performance. So the way this works is you can provision pool storage on Spindle and pool storage on SSD and insert the SSD pools which transparently into the data path. The client doesn't know about it um, and cache the data. And that happens in two ways. We have a full write-back cache, so both reads and writes go to the cache. Um, the write hits the cache first of all, some point of time, and um, uh, written to backing or base pool, um, and uh, if it goes cold, it's just it's flushed out the cache. If it goes hot, it's all back up again. So, pretty standard caching. Um, but it also works in a read only mode here. Yeah. So, if you know that the data is just going to be cold because it's long or you know, stuff that you need for compliance, you can just get it straight onto the backing pool, but know that you can get it up to a hot tier pretty quickly. So, we're pretty excited about this uh, feature, and obviously, you know, you can use it. Um, uh, with with OpenStack deployments. Um, but also, we have Erasure Coding coming up. Very proud to be the first open source product to come out with Erasure Coding. Um, so, this is a different way of doing data integrity instead of keeping replicas, which are expensive. You just store parity bits, spread them out across the uh, service and across the cluster. Um, initially, we're seeing this as um, useful for the object storage uh, use cases. Um, more adventurous of you might want to try it while we need all the recommended production as yet. Um, but when combined with the cache here, we have a very compelling uh, option for cold storage or archive. I'll leave the roadmap, which is as a product manager, this is all I can't make no guarantees, I just promise this with no um, But we've got more working on the file system, we've got RB mirroring coming out, so very similar to Snap Mirror from the NetApp world, so if you want to do German blocks between. Um, multi -center, uh, sorry, multiple data centers, you can do that. Um, importantly, the RBD kernel module, which is not used with the open stack typically, um, which gives you native access to block devices through your, um, through your host, through your kernel, and will hopefully be available uh, with full rail server support uh, with the next release of the And I will skip all of the other stuff and leave the training slide up and open up all the questions for me. Or Yes, yeah, I think we may have to come up here and ask some questions. There's a microphone here. Just direct in front of you. So. Uh, I just wanted to know a little bit more about the erasure coding. What's the problem it solves and how it solves? So the problem it solves is that to um, have data integrity where you can do disks and still have, and still have the data available. Where it's right um, the existing or pre existing mechanisms or replications store duplicates of that the file. So you actually can have image, you store three, three cat images, three copies. So store so any because three more side of data that becomes very expensive. So you have a 2x or a 3x cost for data integrity. Ray coding uses an algorithm to create parity bits very similar to RAID. So you're typically looking at a more rate of five or six costs yeah. and you get the same level of um, um, Resiliency in the event that you use a, a disk or multiple nodes or anything else to still guarantee that the data is available. Um, but it's reconstructed um, through an algorithm rather than just saying, okay, let me grab one of these backup copies and, and move that over to 
Right, so that basically means that at the time of um, uh, at the time of recovery, uh, you will have some latency, right? Compared to the, the traditional method of replication. That can be, but the cost of storage is yeah. going to be cheaper. That's great. I think I'll But yes, but the, depending on the way you use it, actually, and we have some interesting stuff for the user product, um, the performance hit can be is, is not too bad, depending on the size of the image. You have very, very large images of all the complicated to use. And cost of storage can be again debatable because it, we keep talking about commodity storage. Commodity is going to be cheap, typically, right? So, but I understand the point. So, if you have extra of storage instead of small, a lot of value. Okay. Right. So, basically, the, the whole point here is to reconstruct data based on some algorithm. Uh, exactly. I was confused because you said erasure coding, so why it's called erasure coding? I mean, what's, what's being erased here? Um, it's, it's, right it's, yeah, it's the industry term. Wikipedia may be in the background. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I noticed that uh, Simba Fest is generally left out of all the uh, announcements. Uh, should we read between the lines on that one? No. Um, so it's Simba Fest, but I think it's going to continue. And um, you know, I, I, we have to hear some resourcing plans or anything else, but there's definitely no indication that they're going to be stopped, and it's quite the opposite, I think. Yeah, but they're all on Red Hat to continue development there. Um, you know, they, I think the acquisition of Impact was obviously um, part of it was open stack, but all of it was open stack. We're a very good company to cluster. We have a lot of options in enterprise storage beyond just the uh, you know, open stack block in this case, and file systems is an important part of that. Um, remember, the Red Hat's going all in on the big data as well, and so the best there's some, some interesting things going on with the view from other pieces. So, um, so I think technology-wise, no, I don't think anything's going to change. And product-wise, timing of release of products in the SFS, that's the kind of things which will have to come out of the way. All right, thanks. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much.